And then you pick another node and you walk until you get the part you've frozen. Again, you keep erasing the So when you've done a lot of span entry, and it turns out magically it's math, but it's uniform on all span trees. So you can calculate that. That's actually relatively quick in these problems. And then you have to calculate the total number of span trees, but that's just a determinant of a submatrix of the Laplacian on the combinatorial Laplacian. And so that's just Kirchhoff's topic. So you can do that. That's a little more expensive, but people have spent generations learning how to do fast determinants in linear algebra. So you know, it's a good thing when your slowest part of your algorithm is something that people have spent generations getting good at. All right, so here we go, that same problem. And as I said to you before, the problem is calculating this backwards direction, the probability of that happening. Because what's happening here? I'm taking this step, okay, that's just probably of choosing two adjacent ones. That's whatever I say it is. That's easy to calculate. Then I pick a new spanning tree. To calculate, consider uniform on spanning trees using Wilson's algorithm, I just need to know the number of spanning trees, which is just a determinant. I can calculate that. Then there's only a few choices to split usually, so that's pretty easy to figure out what the chance of picking the one I chose. And then I end up here. The trick is how many different spanning trees here could have given this one? Oh, I forgot. So let me give you some numerics before I finish that thought. So here's some numerics. These are the elections, and then this is the percentage Democrat in the most Republican, the second most Republican, and the most Democratic district. And I have the merge split argument that I just showed you, and enumeration. The reason I'm using county clusters is because some of these county clusters, using actually recent work, you can enumerate them exactly. You can actually, using an algorithm that cleverly prunes the search tree, you can actually write to disk all the enumerated possible. Some of them have like 40,000, 80,000 degree districtings, but you can enumerate them. And those are really nice to have as test examples. And it's also an interesting question. So if you look at these two plots, they're getting down to 0.01. This is total variation distance. This is 0.05. It's pretty good. You can actually calculate the total variation on the whole measure, on the empirical measure. It's not doing as well in the same node. So there's actually some concentration of measure going on here. And that's an interesting question to get at, and we're thinking about that. And there's this tuning parameter. We actually are interested at gamma equals 1, because that represented the original measure we started with. But at gamma equals 0, uh, we don't have to count. I'm mean, sorry, gamma equals 1. Backwards at gamma equals one. Okay, something's wrong. I think I flipped something here. It should be the gamma equals zero is the cheap one because you don't have to calculate this ratio. So I did something wrong. I'll figure that out. It's not good. So as I said, the hard part is calculating this. And here's a quick slide, sorry, just to convince you that this is okay. So what you do is you take the partition, you take the trees. You merge them into a new subgraph. You generate a random spanning tree. You split that spanning tree into two. But if you do the other one, when you go all the way to the partition, you have to invert this step. And there are many spanning trees that give you one random partition. And so you have to sum over all these possibilities. This term is this one. And you have to sum over all of this, the preimage of this, which is really expensive. It's spanning trees times spanning trees. So it's really huge. And that was the problem. And so making this little twist Makes it all work. All right, so, you said I have 10 more minutes? Huh? 15. 15. Oh, she's saying. All right. So maybe you don't like this, though. Maybe we should just replace Metropolis Casey. So let me now, okay, take a breath. You can ask me a question about that if you want. All right, so what first idea was let's make a better proposal that does a global move. And what's nice about that is you can actually mix it with the spin flips. Because the spin flips have certain nice properties about relaxing the boundary in a nice way relative to counting clustering. So you want to mix the two. And since they have the same invariant measure, because now I can do Metropolis Hastings, I can interweave the two and I can preserve the same invariant measure. Let's, let's think of a different idea. Let's throw Metropolis Hastings out the window. What's bad about Metropolis Hastings is that it is reversible. If you do PDEs, you probably know that if you have, if you want to look at mixing in a PDE, if you add advection, if you have pure diffusion, it mixes slowly. If you add advection to it, it mixes much faster. Right? The best way to 
mix smoke into a room is to blow it around, not to wait for it to get to the corners, right? So let's add a vection. Instead of having, here's a simple problem. With diffusions, you jump back and forth with one half. What's the invariant measure on this? Uniform. A better way to sample the uniform measure is just to walk around and check every node. Because this takes square root of n to get around, and this one takes n. Okay, that's not very practical unless you know exactly what's going on. So Percy, uh, Bradford Neal, and uh, Susan Holmes had a nice idea, which I think was based on something that came from the physics literature, maybe, but um, we should ask them. There's also a bunch of physics papers that picked up on this. This is this idea of lifting. So you take a reversible Markov chain, you split it in two. So what you do is you add a new state, plus or minus, which you should really think of as momentum. This is really a discrete momentum Langevin sampler. We actually have a continuous version that I'm not talking about today. <clears throat> so you have plus or minus momentum. Plus momentum is going to move this way. Minus momentum is going to move that way. And what you do is you step accordingly with this in the proposal. And whenever you finally reject, you flip the sign of your momentum. So now you can go in the other direction next time. Because apparently you've hit a wall. You've hit some steep climb. And so this lets you kind of have, there's a lot of this going on now in these piecewise Markovian samplers. Piecewise uh, deterministic samplers that people are using like zigzag and things like that. There's some of these ideas there. But, but this is particularly useful here. So one of our, what our contribution is to show how to do this in this interesting graph sampling problem. And we have a pretty general framework. He said we have a pretty general framework. There we go. Right, you skip the rejection step. So instead of rejecting the Metropolis Hastings, you just flip the momentum. <clears throat> so what we're going to have is we have our partition, right? And now we're going to add a bunch of type of data fix up. Huh? We're going to have a momentum for some number of momentums, which I'll explain what they are. And this is our measure we want to sample. We just define it like this. And so we're going to be uniform over all the choices of theta. This is a finite set. So by having this not depend on it, it's just uniform. But the marginal is still the measure we want. <laughs> then we're going to come up with an involution. So something which is composite with itself twice, and you get the identity. That's just what happens in Hamiltonian mechanics. And what we're going to do here is the i involution is going to flip the i momentum. It's just going to flip it. And because of this property, this involution is actually invariant, strictly speaking, this map. And so then you have what was called in those papers, in all those papers I showed you before, skewed detail balance. So we have some rule based on where you are in state space, this x is together, about which involution I choose. And I just require this to be true. If you have this property also, then, you all, then pi is also an invariant measure of the system. All right? But this lets you add momentum to a system. And what you're really doing is you're splitting up Metropolis Hastings. So here's Metropolis Hastings again. You propose with whatever chain you wanted to at the beginning, think single node flip. I now have this rejection rate, but instead the forward probability is this one, and the backward is this peg property that I want before, because I really want some kind of skew. The flux going this way in one fiber is equal to the flux going this way in the other fiber. But this is the plus and this is the minus state, for instance. I want that ratio. So this is just the Metropolis-Hastings rejection scheme. And with this probability, I accept and I move that state. Or not, I flip the spin. Yes, so Professor Thrain. So the process is to speed up the process by which you get to sampling from the target distribution? That's why it's I'm doing this because I have the intuition that adding momentum to the space makes me explore it better. So, but the objective is to get to, to, get to sampling from that faster. Yes. Okay. Please. Sorry, I, I'm lost at the notation. Yeah, please. In the skew balance, so the subscript i of x, x prime, what, what's going so, on? So you could, if you want to only have one of these, you could just choose this to be that one. But I have a whole bunch of these. And I have a rule based on what x I'm in. I'm going to explain in just a second, to choose them. Okay, and that's, that's maybe new in this paper, I don't know. You know, it's either, it's either a bad idea and it's new, or it's a good idea, which by definition means somebody else already had it. Right, so, yeah. What is the last two terms of n after k? What? So n after k, so a number of elemental variables here. 
yes, there's k different momentum variables, and you can choose that depending on your problem. Let me give you an example. So, actually, let me, let me yeah, so here's my example. I'm going to take the state space, the graph produced by this Markov chain. So if I'm sitting at a state partitioning a coloring of my graph, and I look at all the places I could go, so that's the graph produced on the state space by this Markov chain. <clears throat> and now I'm going to partition that, uh, before I partition, I'm going to pick every one of these edges and I'm going to decide which direction is positive. This direction is positive, then this one better be negative. And so I have the plus, which says 1 when it's positive, and I define the, the alpha minus to give a 1 when it's a negative edge, so directed edges. Then I pick a partition of all these edges that I can walk across, a partition, and I intersect with the plus and the minus. And then based on which partition I'm in, I'm going to use the involution for that. So that's a very abstract, but I'm going to give you three examples in a moment to make it precise. Okay? And then who cares? This is the right definition. It satisfies you to tell when you do it. It says you take a step from the Markov chain I knew how to sample from. And then I, I think I may have switched pink cube. Then I sum it up this way. And if this happens, if I don't get this step, I reject and I flip. If not, I take the step. All right. So we have three different ideas here. One idea is we look at each of the districts. We not look at each of the numbers. We have a separate graph over here. And we say, am I currently trying to flow precincts from district 1 to district 2? That's positive. Or backwards is the other one. So I have a graph between the labelings of the districts. And I put a flow, I pick each edge, I give it a sign. And that's the positive direction. And I put a momentum for each of those edges. Another one is we actually put a swirling flow on the entire state of North Carolina. And we flow that. But we actually find it's better if we flow according to the center of mass of the district. OK? So let me show you an example. So here's an example. Here's North Carolina. Yes? Yes. And that and it doesn't matter the first Except I would maybe use the word cost. Okay. So it just doesn't matter. Right. Okay. I mean your spectral theory is more complicated, that's what you're worried about. Yes, ma'am. Alright, so here is my districts, which I've just decided to represent here. So really this is like I'm in, this is my pot, my current direction. Whenever I choose the flow mass between this district and this district, I'm gonna try to flow in this direction. And here I have one between every pair of districts that are adjacent at the moment. And now I'm going to make a bunch of choices. I just did this one, and then I did that one, and then I did that one. I did some choice, made some choice. It tends to go in a cycle because they kind of want to go. That's what gets accepted. And then if I do that flow, you see I'm flowing all that mass via those arrows. And then I try another one. I'm going to try this one over here, and it's going to fail. And when it fails, it's good. Whoops, sorry. When it fails, it's going to flip the edge. So next time I try to flow between those two, I'm going to flow in the other direction. So this kind of gets rid of this dithering back and forth, this futile cycle of jumping back and forth. It tends to lead to more mixing. All right. Another example is I'm going to do this on this box here. I'm, this is a 100 by 100 grid, right? I put the vertices down. And I put this flow on it. And the simplest version is I look at a district, and <clears throat> I'm only going to accept moves. I'm only going to make the moves that would move the center of mass in the direction of this flow when I'm going positive. And when I'm going negative, I would do it in the opposite direction. OK? And I do that for each district pair of districts. So I kind of, it's well, I mean, each district, whether its center of mass is currently following the flow or going against the flow. And, and, and I'm being a little bit smarter. I'm not going to just pick edges at random. I'm actually going to temper. What that means is I'm going to look at the edge cuts along them and see whether when I make that change, it reduces the boundary between two districts or not. And I'm going to pick them according to this weight on the cuts, because that's cheap to calculate. And I, it's easy to update. So. I'm going to temper, that is, I'm going to use that, not just pick them uniformly, but then I have to put that in my neutropolis case things to make it still get the right distribution. And here's my plan. I'm going to show you a movie now. Almost there. 
All right, so here it is. So let me show you what you got. This is uniform. These are two districts. This is really hot off. This is in progress. This one, the first paper's on the archive. That's a funny story. You can ask me about that question if you want to. This one is just uniform proposals. This one is local spin flips that are tempered. And then this is tempered with the swirling <coughs> flow. Uh, let me just say that there's, there's this, there, in that paper that I mentioned of before and company and Solomon, they show that after a billion steps, this one never goes sideways. So now I'm going to run for, I think, a million, not a billion. There it goes. There it's moving. I'll be anticipation. Oh, there it goes. It flipped. Now it's going to actually flip all the way around the top. <coughs> so this is still sampling from the right measure, but it's, it's getting over the energetic barrier because of this advection. And this is actually a heat map of where, which, ver which, which vertices were flipped. You see these two basically stay like they were all the time, and this one is pretty isotropic. It's lost the memory of its initial condition. All right, so those are my three flows. So I'll just kind of end with quickly, I know I'm almost out of time, I am already. I'll just say there's been a lot of work on gerrymandering lately, and there's a lot of interesting problems out there in space for you to get into. People doing kind of total variation profile stuff. This is this paper using bottlenecks and capacitance to talk about mixing. There, we did some work where we actually instead put layers like parallel tempering and stratified sampling and other types of sampling schemes on top to try to do better sampling that had mixed results. There's also interesting visualization problems, just like in protein folding. How do you understand when you're doing things and how do you understand what elections get what kind of results and what not? This is an attempt to understand only mildly successfully using SVD, kind of a local PCA. There's toy examples. You can put down the density of Republicans versus Democrats with a random 4A series, and then redistrict this grid into nine districts, which is easy. And then ask, what do those box plots look like? They look a lot like the ones I had before. Can you explain what, how the parameters affect those? There's these really interesting works on exact sampling that people have been doing. And this is to show you, this is actually my expert report from court. I submitted this to the court. And I actually had the enumeration section in my report to the court where I talked about the effect of, you know, why I was confident in my results. Um, uh, there's a whole other set of things, which was Wes Tekken and Alan Fries and Marina started, where they're doing significance testing without assuming that everything ever comes to equilibrium. They do it without assuming a stationary assumption, which is interesting. Um, and then a whole bunch of different tests on how to evaluate gerrymandering and stuff in the popular literature. And then again, all these cases in court that have this mathematics in it. And if you don't know, in North Carolina, Virginia flipped yesterday partially because they redrew their maps. Yesterday in North Carolina, they were redrawing our congressional maps because they had been ordered to by Case that was using this map um, and other people's maps. There were three experts. I should have been all of us. I think that helped. And then we're also just in the process of redrawing our state legislature maps because of also another case that threw out those maps. So. There's a whole bunch of people who were involved in this. This started with an undergraduate project of Christy Vaughn, who's now just finishing her PhD on mean field games with Renee Carmona. Um, I'm going to try to hire her. You can try to, too. I would. I'm going to. Um, and a whole bunch of other undergrads. Uh, undergrads and then some faculty, Wes, and some lawyers, Guy Charles and others, who have helped and talked a lot with us. And um, happily, uh, my university helped support this work. Um, the NSF wasn't so quick to do it. And if you want to learn more, you can go to our blog, where we have a bunch of information and papers and other presentations. So uh, we'll end with the movie, and I'll say thank you very much. So in the Spanning tree approach. Yeah. What is the interpretation of the edges between vertices? It's, it's, 
It's whether they're adjacent. So there's a vertex for every district? Yep, every precinct. Every precinct. I Districts see. are made out of precincts. Sure. Yeah. So I guess my question is not about the mathematics, but well, it, maybe it's a little bit about the mathematics, which is, so you focus on the sort of the two states in situation. Well, in this, in this. Yeah, but so politically, I guess historically, it seems to me there are other considerations besides Democrat versus Republican, like for example, making an you know all African all, an African American. Yeah. So, district. so in my in my stuff that I presented in Rucho, there was an energy about whether it satisfied the VRA. Uh -huh. So there was whether one district was above forty two percent African American and whether one district was above thirty four percent African American. And there was just a, a binary function that gave you credit if you did it and hurt you if you didn't, and then I smoothed it so I could optimize against it. There's also things about communities of interest, where we're wanting to preserve cities and municipalities, which are generally considered communities. Look, you can, whatever you want to do, you just have to figure out a way to put it in the map, and then you can do this, right? And so that's what I was trying to say is like, I think I like the fact that what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, let's talk about what our design principles are for this geographically based representative system we have. And then let's ask what those outcomes should typically look like, and then we can compare them to a certain map and see whether this one would have been likely drawn if you had not looked at things that you claim you were not looking at. When making, so adjusting the democratic state by vote, are you randomly picking some of the number of company votes and flipping them to do this, or just like what We're you shifting mean? precinct by precinct percentages of runs. It's called the uniform swing hypothesis. It's far from perfect. But I'm not claiming it's predicting what would happen. I'm giving it a realistic spatial vote pattern. And when you actually move it up and you get close to other actual elections that were close to that, it's not totally crazy. But it's not monolithic, you're right. There's actually a plot that I went back to where I have two different spatial vote patterns at the exact same statewide percentage and they act completely differently. And that's an interesting question. It's a little bit like finding reaction states or like what's important about this configuration that makes it behave one way or the other. There's some interesting questions that uh, Mara's going to solve. So, so. Mara was next. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, you about the, the, the design of the adaption. Yeah. I mean, uh, geometrically, yes, it provides some intuition, but you know, the constraints are not just geographic. Right. Like a lot of them. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah. why we have this other one. We did one that's just <laughs> So that's not geographical, and somehow it's just flowing through. There's, we, you know, we have this flow. Um, we only got the code for it on Tuesday. So which week? <laughs> so, so these are all really good questions. And TBA. <laughs> it's, yeah. Are there any jurisdictions in the world that have actually used random gerrymandering? A random district? Yeah, so usually I say that I'm not in the, just, I'm not in the business of making maps. I'm in the business of evaluating maps. That being said, when they started the state Congressional House of Representatives redistricting, they actually started from one of the other expert witnesses' random map. They literally brought in a bingo thing, and they turned it, and they pulled out a ping pong ball with a number on it, and they went and got that number map from his collection. And then they did, but the point is, and then they, then they proposed them. I mean, it's not quite as crazy as sounds, although it's pretty crazy. I mean, in the way that, then they proposed amendments. And because they were following a court order, they made all those amendments in public. And so you had to say, I want to move this precinct like this and move that over there for this reason. Or they could just say it, and then somebody from the other side would say, you know, would the good gentleman from Mecklenburg County please explain his reasoning for that? And so that was all in open. So starting from a random one, gave them some place to start, and then they modified. But I do think that it's not realistic to think we can encode every one of our political and societal and you know, preferences, right? There's some nuance, and that's why we have committees, right? That's why we have, you know, when people say, how many papers did you have to write to get tenure? It's like, yeah, it doesn't really work that way. I mean, if I had no papers would I've gotten tenure, highly unlikely. You know, if I had 100 papers at the time I went for tenure, when I got tenure, probably more, you know, I got it, but it would have increased the odds. But if they had been crapped, you know, you know, it's not so simple, right? There's not a number. Uh, if, if you can, if you once you're done being able to sample from the district, can you then sample from the 
had a gotcha mechanism. Can you tell us whether the initial 2012 North Carolina map we saw was an extreme case or not? Well, I already did that with the with the simulator and the other times, right? I already created. That's what I did at the very beginning. It was an extreme. <laughs> I had to be. It was. It was huge. It was way over the edge. Look at this. Oh, oh that one. Okay. Yeah, this is it. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back to my movie. Let's go back. There we go. It's not going to move for a heck of a long time. 45, 46, 47, 48, 8. You know, it's not moving at all. So this right now is the regime that North Carolina usually is, somewhere between the 49 and 51, right? <coughs> But I could just check it against my ensemble the same way. Right, okay. Right? And part of the idea is, you know, the, to have things like this ready. I mean, you know, I'm talking to people and trying to help them have their own ability to have an ensemble ready so when they redistrict the state, the news media, the people who want to talk about it can say, like, hey, look, this one looks like a typical map. This one doesn't.